What is the highest priority action step I can do today that will serve the greatest amount of people with the resources that I have in the most effective and efficient way that inspires me? That's a very powerful question to ask yourself. That's the same question that Bill Gates asks himself every day. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to stay inspired and find opportunity during this COVID-19 time, then do we have the show for you. Today, I'll be talking with The Secrets, Dr. John Demartini, the best-selling author of over 40 books, including The Values Factor. Today, we'll talk about staying inspired, overcoming your emotions, and maximizing your full potential, not despite, but because of this interesting time. That plus we'll talk about embracing heroes and villains, you stress and de-stress, self-help and rose glasses, the amygdala and delusions, missions and objectives, and what in the world are quantifiable fermionic states. So welcome back to the show, John. Gotcha. Are you ready to shine? I'm ready to shine. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. So from what I understand, you're in Houston, which means you're not in, on your home, which is a ship with billionaires. When was the last time that you were on it? And what's going on with the ship right now? Well, the ship, that's interesting. I, I, uh, the ship is actually floating through the Suez Canal yeah. and coming in eventually towards the Mediterranean and headed over through the Mediterranean over into not London, but in England, the southern tip of England. And it'll be sitting there until we're ready to get back on the ship. So it's sailing to a port there temporarily and doing a little bit of maintenance and then people be allowed back on. They've, they've had everybody off for a bit of time now. Uh, understandable. Now, that's a ship that has a substantial number of billionaires on it. What are your, your compatriots, your neighbors, what are they doing during this time? Well, right now they've asked, there's just a limited amount of crew on there right now. Mm -hmm. And everybody is at their other homes. Many people have multiple homes. So they're at, at other homes right now. And they're refurbishing and doing some upgrades on it while they're using the time. And then they'll have us back on there probably in the next 30 days or so. That makes sense. How have you been handling the situation? And how have you stepped back and looked at things overall, both for yourself and maybe even for humanity? Well, in my situation, I really can't gripe too much. I've, I've gone online and all of my programs have been done online. I haven't missed any programs. I've, we've actually got higher numbers than we've ever had. Our business has grown during this time. So I can't, um, I really can't complain. I, 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 some people could call it coronavirus. I could call it St. Corona for, for, from what it is. But I also use my economics as wisely as I could to make sure that I could take advantage of the market fluctuations I've tried to come up with have a plan B as a backup plan for online systems. We made a transition pretty smoothly. We'd already been making some of that transition. So I'm not in the some of the situations that some people are facing. But um, that also I'm sitting in, in one place. I'm normally traveling full time. I live full time traveling. And so normally I'm on the go and I'm going country to country, country. Now I'm going country to country at, at different time zones, sitting in one place. But uh, I've turned my hotel uh, into a kind of a, a gym and an outdoor uh, exercise program. I'm going out and doing things outside. So I just adapt. I mean, it's not what happens to us. It's how we perceive it, what we decide to do with it, and how we act. I'm, I'm a firm believer that it's, it's never the outside world that determines how we feel or what we decide to do. It's us. So we have to take command and use whatever's happening to our greatest advantage. So you, you talk about this lot, a, a lot, about taking things and turning them into positive, meaningful experiences. So as you started to see this coming, a wave of, of weirdness, of lockdown, of something coming, were you asking yourself specifically, how do I turn this into a positive, meaningful experience? I can't say that I saw it as, uh, as a devastating experience in the first place. I just saw it as, okay, this is going to push us towards what we were planning on doing anyway, more online. Yeah. It escalated. We went from a... We, I had 20 cities that I shut down uh, that had programs in it. But what we did is we converted those into online programs live, and we ended up having more people. And so I just did strange hours, but that's a minor thing. That's not a major thing. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and if we're reaching people now in countries around the world that we haven't been able to reach. So I always say that there's never a crisis without a blessing. There's never a window that shuts without a door opening. There's always other sides. If you take the time to open your eyes, you can see them. 
And once you do, you adapt, you have resilience and you don't react and you don't even see it as a crisis. You see it as a transformation. So I'm a firm believer that masters live in the world of transformation and most people live in the illusions of gain and loss and they get t- trapped by that. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer if you're seeing a crisis, that's because you're not taking the time to look for the upsides. If you take the time to see how the crisis is serving you and the upsides that are there that you're just overlooking, you can change the perception and take off some of the distress that's there and free yourself up to get even more creative, to come up with even more momentum building solutions that grow uh, greater opportunities in your life. Thank you. I'm thinking I was reading an article this morning talking about miles long lines of people waiting to go to food banks and and that uh, food stamps or SNAP or whatever it is doesn't actually go far enough to make people more than maybe two weeks. You say masters live in the world of transformation. How yeah. do we reframe this when we might be one of those people stuck in the car? Well, I know this is probably not going to be something that everybody wants to hear, yeah. but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a story. Can I share a story to give the answer? Would be honored. Okay. When I'm nine years old, My dad, I went to my dad and I said, I want to buy a baseball. I want to buy a glove. I want to buy a bat. He said, fantastic. And I said, so how do I, how do I get that? How do I earn that? He said, well, did you mow the yard? Yes. Did you edge the sidewalk? Yes. Did you sweep the the garage out? Yes. Did you trim the hedges? Did you weed the flower beds? And, and, And he went through a list of about 10 things or whatever. And I've done all those. And he said, son, I have nothing that needs to be done. So you can't, I just can't give you money without service. So I suggest you go to the neighbors and see if you can find somebody you can serve. So I went, oh, okay. So I walked up and down the street and I found a yard that looked like it needed some, some repair and some upgrades. So I knocked on the door and I offered the service. Mm-hmm. The lady asked me how much and I didn't think in advance to come up with a number, but I just came up with a number on the spot. And she said, that sounds reasonable. When can you do it? And I said, I'll do it now. So I mowed her yard, I edged her sidewalk, I weeded her flower beds, and I trimmed her all her hedges. I spent the day doing that. And she paid me a really good money. Yeah. And I went out and bought a baseball, a glove, and a bat. And my dad saw these things. He said, what did, what, did you, what did you do to earn the money? And I said, I went to the neighbors and did what you told me. He said, fantastic. What equipment did you use? I said, the, the equipment in the garage. He said, well, son, I have to charge you for the use of that equipment. I said, well, how much? He said, well, and it turned out to be $7.50. I said, well, Dad, I spent the money. He said, well, that will teach you to make sure you pay your bills before you spend your money. You don't, it's not money that yours. So now if you want to go make more money, you got, you got to owe me something, and i got to charge you interest for those days. It was very, very, you know, by the book, because that's real life. So I had to go do three more yards to get caught up and still have a bit of profit. And then I started to figure out, okay, as a result of that, I'm working harder and making less. And I ended up getting three kids to help me in the yards and then three more kids and three more kids. So I had nine kids working for me when I was nine years old. This is 1963. Help me around doing all the neighbor's yards. And I got other people's equipment and I had to pay for their equipment. And I had a little business going and I made money. And I net after all the people paid and dad was paid and gas was paid and everything else. I netted $45 in a day. Sometimes my dad said, well, now I got to teach you the next thing. You're not saving any of your money. You're spending it all. And if you don't save it, it'll never work for you. You'll work for it all your life. So I had to, I had to go and start doing a coin collection set in a piggy bank, which I still have in my, my office today, the original piggy bank from 1963. It's never been opened. As a metaphor to remember, you think long term. Then he started charging me for food, clothing, and rent. $7.50 a week. That's 30 bucks a month, a dollar a day. My dad loved me and cared about me to make me face reality about how life was going to be Mm -hmm. because I had a learning problem. Now, the reason I say that is that gave me a mindset that there's never a lack of opportunity. There's never a lack of money for somebody who cares about humanity to find out what people's new needs are. So if we sit and we bitch instead of go out and enrich, Mm -hmm. we're not going anywhere. So the thing that I, I did is I learned that if I'm in a situation where I needed money, I go knock on doors and find out what I can do to be of service to people. If that meant moving stuff in their house, cleaning out their garage, doing the yard, anything and anything that I would be willing to do. I, I flushed toilets. I did whatever it took to generate the income I did. So I'm not saying that everybody has to go out and do that. What I'm saying is that a wise individual, instead of seeing a crisis, will look for opportunities because there's new needs that are always being met 
on the planet. And if we care about, there's new needs. Right now, because I'm here, I could use somebody to go and go to the store and get stuff for me. So if somebody came up to me and said, hey, I'll, I'll transport whatever you need from the stores and get things for me, that would be great because my time is too valuable sitting here doing this than it is to go out and go grocery shopping or something. I don't do that. I haven't grocery shopped in years, decades. So I would rather have somebody do it. So there's no matter who you are, there's always some need. And it's caring enough about humanity to find out what that need is now. And just because there's a change, because of coronavirus or this or this is shut down or whatever, doesn't mean there's not new needs. So caring enough about people to find out what their new needs are and being adaptable to fill those needs is how you get a source of income and how you stabilize your life and how you turn crisis into opportunity. I had a gentleman in Bali that just sent me an email because he heard me do a presentation about that. And he thought about it instead of wallowing in his pity, instead of running a story and being victim of history, he became a master of destiny. He looked for needs and he found a need that was massive, massive. And now he's got a, a massive business opportunity that's about to make him way more money than he's ever had in his life. And he goes, gosh, if it wasn't for the coronavirus, I wouldn't have got this opportunity. But because he went looking to how he could fill people's needs, he turned his crazies into opportunities. So I'm a firm believer that it's we can sit there and go wait for the food banks. And we can be bitching and everything else. And that may be necessary temporarily. But ultimately, we got to go and find somebody we can be of service to if we want to be an exchange. You have to make fair, sustainable exchanges to be able to have an income, to be able to have an outcome in life. Thank you. You talk about the importance of doing something that we spontaneously love. So were you talking about something that's in, in highest alignment rather than just, or, or is it we can do something that we really don't love now, but look for what's pulling on that heartstring? If you're in a situation where you're in, you're in food stamps, you're just barely surviving and you're sitting hours there, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't waste my time on that. I'd personally, I would be sitting there going and finding a way who needs service, who needs something done. There, there's, there's a, I'm sitting in a hotel looking out. I noticed that the hotel right now needs the yards done. It, it, it needs to be trimmed and stuff. There's a job right there. I, I, I can see jobs right here. Uh, there's a construction site that needs stuff removed, but somebody's not removing it. And normally it is. I see opportunities where other people see crisis. And so finding out what those are and looking for those is the solution. And, and you may not be inspired to do those now, but then you ask the simple question, how is doing this temporarily going to help me get to what I want to do in life? Because if I can go and do a real right now what I really love to do and delegate things, I'll do it if I can generate income from it. If I can't, then I'll, I'll take this temporary job and find out how, how we doing this temporarily will help me get to the next step. There's nothing degrading about going and doing something intermittent, transiently, temporarily, if it's a stepping stone to something that's going to get you where you want to go in life. But if you can see a pathway on how to get what you want to do directly, where you're inspired to do it, that's the wisest thing to be doing. First look there, then go down from there. But see everything on the way, not in the way, and ask yourself, how do I do what I love? And, and get paid to do it? And how do I can delegate lower party things so I can get inspired to do it? Or how can I see whatever is in, in this situation and opportunity now? How is it temporarily on the way until I can get to the next step? If you do, it's a mindset. And all of a sudden, you build momentum and not restriction. Thank you. And speaking of the mindset, you talk about you won't get your peak potential in life living in past and futures. We need to be anchored in this moment if we're going to set ourselves free, don't we? Yeah, what, what many people are doing, I'm finding right now that are coming in. I, I, I spoke to 400,000 people the other day, and, I, and it's like people coming in with all these questions, you know, when it's not what it used to be. Okay, life is that way. Yeah. So sitting there and comparing your current reality to how it used to be, comparing your current reality about your fantasy, how you wish it would be, is not the way you get grounded. What is now fact? How do I use this fact to help me fulfill what I'm inspired to do? That's what you want to do. Not comparing fact to a fantasy, the past or future, but right now. What's going on right now? What is the highest priority thing I can do right now in the setting I'm in right now to can help me fulfill my mission on planet Earth, what I feel I want to do in my life? What is it that I would be so inspired to do that I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and do it? How is whatever's happening helping me get there? If you ask that question, you'll build momentum. I had a guy in South, South Africa the other day. He's suicidal. He says, I want to take my life. I said, why? is because my old life is gone. I said, what's the drawback of your old life? Oh, there was no drawback. Bull 
what's the drawback of your life? And I found out the, the downsides. I said, now, what's the upsides of right now? And we made him make a list of it. I spent 20 or 30 minutes with him. All of a sudden, he started feeling a bit lighter. And he goes, I said, the only reason you're sitting down and you're wanting to take your life is because you're comparing your current reality to a fantasy that wasn't even true and to an ideal about what you haven't taken the, and put a strategy to go make happen. So let's get grounded. Let's find out what it is. And let's go and care about somebody and serve. Because if right now you're focusing on yourself, you're not going to get out of this situation. You're fo- you need to be focusing on what you can do to make a difference in somebody's life and get in fair exchange and make the income to pay your bills. Because right now you're sitting there wallowing about how you can't afford things and you're sitting there with your thumb up your butt. That's not going to get you a result. What's going to get a result is going out and caring about somebody and going making a difference in somebody's life. That's what fulfillment is. That's the source of income. That gives you some meaning in life. That's the only way to be focusing your attention. I like it. And and also going back to that person in South Africa, on, on the one hand, I'm not being facetious here. On the one hand, he lost he lost everything about the old way of living. On the other hand, that just set him free. He's a very yeah. dangerous man in the most beautiful way now because he can create something even better. That's it. The thing is, we sometimes, the fantasy, a fantasy is an assumption that something's got a positive without a negative. Mm-hmm. A nightmare is an assumption we got something that's negative without a positive. They don't exist. There is no such thing as a one-sided anything. There's no magnet on one side. There's no individual on one side. There's no event with one side. Until we, with our skewed, distorted, subjectively biased perspective, see it that way. And then we've trapped ourselves. Then we fear the loss of the things we're infatuated with. And we fear the, the gain of the fear the gain of the things we resent. And we live in our own self-imposed fears. But when we balance out our equation and then get grounded about our thing. Our executive center comes online in our brain and we see opportunities and we take advantage of the opportunities because I'm not, I'm convinced that this, this so-called Corona thing is not the end of the world. It's an opportunity for some people that are taking advantage of it, but the people that are not, and they're sitting there running their story about the past or the fantasies of the future, they're not getting grounded. And then they're just going to be, the longer they do that, the more crazies are going to build into their lives. But it's not that what's happening around us, it's what we decide to do with it. Thank you. I want to talk about uh, missions, objectives, and this highest priority because I want functional action steps. You say, what is the highest priority action I can do right now, this minute, that's real, that will allow me to move one step closer to my objective? Yes. On my website, there's a a value determination process. It's a 13-questionnaire process. I look at how people fill their space. I look at how they spend their time. I look at what what energizes them. I look at what, they're, uh, what they spend their money on, naturally. Uh, I look at what they are, uh, where they're organized, where they're ordered, where they're most disciplined spontaneously. What do they think about, visualize, and affirm inside themselves about how they want their life that shows evidence of coming true. I look at what they converse with other people about, want to keep bringing the conversation to. I look at what inspires them and what's common to the people who inspire them. I look at what their goals are that they've had that are actually committed to and acted upon and getting coming true. And then I look at what exactly they love spontaneously learning about. If I look at those criteria, I get an idea of what they are really, truly committed to, not what they think it is. A lot of people come up with a bull that's not really theirs. Once I find out what it is, then I ask, now, what exactly can you do that makes a difference in people's lives doing that? And I'm a, I'm, I've been doing this a long time, 47 years I've been teaching now, going on 48. And I'm absolutely certain there's not one individual that has a clear highest value focus, they can't go and do extraordinary things and make an incredible life out of it. I've seen people of almost every imaginable thing from dancers to to people that want to travel the world and and people that want to do foreign languages. I've shown them how to design a life around what it is they love to do so they can't wait to get up in the morning and do it. Once you decide what that is, then you ask yourself, what is that highest priority thing I can do right now? That numero uno one thing that I can do right now That's an action step, not a long-term set of action steps, but an action step today I can do that moves me one step closer to that. Every single day you're doing that one action step towards it. And if you complete it, then do the next action step. And if you complete that, then do the next action step. But it's those incremental baby, you know, might say domino action steps that keep getting bigger and stronger as you go, that build momentum, that actually become unstoppable. And it's that action step that makes the difference in going a great achievement. And people will just do that and focus on that. Instead of focusing on all the problems, just focus on that one solution. Amazing things get done. Amazing things truly get done in life.
So literally, you could wake up in the morning and ask yourself, what is my highest priority action step I can take today that is going to make the biggest difference? And no matter what, I'm going to take that step forward. One great action step, a question you can ask yourself. Yeah. What is the highest priority action step I can do today that will serve the greatest amount of people with the resources that I have in the most effective and efficient way that inspires me? That's a very powerful question to ask yourself. That's the same question that Bill Gates asks himself every day. I like it. So, so we got to go down into fantasy land then for a minute. What's the difference between fantasies and real objectives? A fantasy is something that's got a positive without a negative, a happy without a sad, a, po- a pleasure without a pain, a peace without a war, a one-sided outcome. It doesn't exist. When, when I come up to somebody and I say, uh, if I meet somebody and I said, you're always kind, never cruel, always positive, never negative, always peaceful, never wrathful, always giving, never taking, always generous, never stingy, always, uh, you know, considerate, never inconsiderate. They go, uh, not Run. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's bull. And I said, if you're always mean, you're never nice. You're always cruel, you're never kind. You're always negative, never positive, always wrathful, never peaceful, always inconsiderate, never considered, always stingy, never generous. They go, no, that's not me. But if I say to him, sometimes you're kind, sometimes you're cruel, sometimes you're nice, sometimes you're mean, sometimes you're positive, sometimes you're negative, sometimes you're generous, sometimes you're stingy, they go, yep, that's me. See, we know inside that we have both sides. And so when we set a goal with both sides intended and we prepare for both sides, we're prepared for the way life is. But if we set up a fantasy that is one-sided and then we get smacked by uncertainties and self-depreciation and phobias and fears, That's a normal feedback to let us know that we're only looking at one side and not embracing both sides and preparing for both sides. So a real objective is not a one-sided event, and a real objective is aligned and congruent with what you really value, not something that's just a whim and a fantasy because you're comparing yourself to other people. You have to set something that's truly high in your values, that's really an objective, which means balanced and balanced-minded, and set in advance with your mind what are the things that could go wrong and how do I solve them in advance. And if you do, you're prepared. And then you don't have the anxieties and you get action steps done. Thank you. So taking this and going back right to the beginning when, when you were talking about how you actually brought your business more online during this time, we have to have a plan B, but a plan B is not necessarily dire and end of the world, maybe far from it. But we're always thinking of different situations. Well, you know, today we, we realize that if all of a sudden my computer went down, it's wise to have a backup computer. Okay, so great. We'll get a backup computer. Another thing is says that sometimes the lighting on here, uh, if all of a sudden there was a blinking or a shortage here, what would I do on backup lighting? So I just had to think of what are things in advance? How do we solve them in advance? What do we do to, to prepare for that? If we do, we have less distress and we have more eustress. Eustress is when you're pursuing challenges that inspire you and distress is when you're trying to avoid challenges that inspire you. It's that simple. If you're looking for a one-sided world, the other side of the world becomes distressful. When you're embracing both sides of the world, it's you stressful. And you stressful is wellness promoting, and yet distress is illness promoting. So it's about preparing your life for the way it is instead of comparing it to a fantasy of how it isn't. Thank you. So let's let's go you stress and de-stress or distress for the moment. And let's talk about embracing stress and embracing challenge. Because this time could actually, I would argue, make us ten times, a hundred times more resilient for everything coming our way. Well, if you're not filling your day with challenges that inspire you, you're designed to fill up with challenges that don't. I, I, I cannot tell people, there's a thing called entropy, a thermodynamic law of entropy that automatically undergoes from order to chaos in life. And if you're not filling your day with order, it's going to fill up with disorder. If you're not putting your money into investments, they go up in value and buying appreciable assets to go up in value. You will keep attracting bills and unexpected bills that will keep taking away your money. And the same thing in life. If you don't fill your day with challenges that inspire you, and the greatest challenges that inspire you are the ones that serve the greatest number of needs. So the person that's wise gets up and goes, what's the biggest problems on the planet I can solve today? That's the smart person. And the, the, the unwise person is going, what, vo- what challenges can I avoid today? And that's the person that's going to keep running into challenges they don't want because they keep running away from challenges. It's the person that gets up and thinks, what's the biggest challenges on the planet? What are the biggest issues right now that people are facing and how do I solve them right now? Right now, if we sat down and thought and meditated a bit, right now, because people are at home and they're sitting there in isolation possibly, and they're trying to get back to work and then they're having to deal with lines or whatever the challenges are, how do we solve those? What can we do to make a difference in those? That's what you want to be looking at. If you do, there's a business opportunity. 
Right now, there's a there's somebody that's designing masks that are custom designed couture, beautiful uh, things that are aesthetic and beautifully a kind of couture masks. Instead of just wearing this ugly mask, they're putting on something that gives fashion. Okay, so now those things are hot selling because people are going. If I'm going to go out, I may as well look good, you know. So they're probably there, and so they're selling. Because somebody got creative and looked at what the challenges are instead of sitting there wallowing and now things are not going the way they fantasize about. How do I use that that opportunity? I like it. I've been skating around. I inline skate a lot. I've got my smiley face mask on. I've been trying to design in my head my shine bright mask, which is kind of our motto, and figure that out. Since you talked about entropy, we might as well we might as well go there with physics for a moment. What in the world are quantifiable fermionic states, and what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> Well, that's a, uh, in physics, there are statistical, um, I guess you could say physics principles. Mm-hmm. One is called the Bose-Einstein statistics. One is called the Fermi-Dirac statistics. Energy particles like photons, mm-hmm. which is energy and light, follow Bose-Einstein statistics. And you can have an infinite number of photons occupying one over infinity space, which is a unique thing of energy. Because a photon is spaceless, timeless, massless, and chargeless. But a fermion is a particle of matter. It's, a, it's like an electron or a positron or, a, it, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a particle of tangible matter. And those statistics are different. That's the fermion Dirac statistics. Fermions are particles of matter. Bosons are particles of energy. Energy without matter is expressionless. Ma- matter without energy is motionless. It's a basic principle. So it's a little bit of technical language for just energy and matter. What used to be called spirit and matter. You know, the ancients used to say spirit without matter is expressionless. Matter without spirit is motionless. But they've turned spirit into energy. That's all. Spirit used to be just the breath, the particles of light, they called it. So all we have now is we have in physics, we have a term called fermions because they honored Enrico Fermi, who was the physicist that coined the statistics to describe these these particles of matter. That's all. Nothing more. And the other one is is, is Einstein and, and uh, the gentleman Bose, you probably Bose speakers, is a physicist. He was studying this. So they basically are, are the ones that put together statistics on, on particles of energy. There's five basic particles of energy and the rest of them are fermion particles. Most of everything is energy or matter and they're constantly converting back and forth. What does that have to do with our daily lives, our energetic states, or dare I even say the word coherence? When we're in an emotional state, we're like a piece of fermion. We're like we're weighing ourselves down gravitationally with matter and when we're in an inspired state and we're living by our highest values and we're really congruent, we're in energy state. So if we live by congruency, we wake up our energy. We, we now function by both statistics. If we automatically sit there and get all wallowing into emotions and get label things positive and negative and get all over the place with infatuation, resentments and fantasies and nightmares, we're stuck gravitating, weighing ourselves down with fermionic states. And fermionic states have poly exclusion principles, which are isolation from other people because no two can occupy the same space time. And they also have uncertainty principles by Heisenberg, which means that it's an uncertainty where you are, what you're doing, and you're confused and you're uncertain. So if you want to go and live by an uncertainty and you want to have a poly exclusion principle, get all emotional. How's that for putting a metaphor on it? But if you're inspired, if you're inspired and you're enlightened, you're going to be full of energy and you're going to have a boson statistic. And then you can be getting a whole lot done with a whole lot less energy and more efficient. That's all I can say. If we want to become a boson statistic, how important is it that we drop our story cold? Well, anytime you wobble and talk about your story, running your story, you're not going to get anywhere. I tell people come into my breakthrough experience, which I've been doing 1,097 times now. And and every time they come in here, if if they run their story, they're not going anywhere. I say, stop the story. The story is bullshit anyway. Let's stop the story. And let's get on to what the what the solution is. Because sitting there wallowing in what this person did or what you didn't do or what you didn't do and comparing what you did. Anytime you're you're expecting somebody to live in your values or you're expecting others to live in your values, you're going to think there's mistakes. You're going to run the story and you're going to be caught in this game. If you go in there and ask yourself, what is the highest priority action I can do today to help me fulfill my life? And how is whatever is happening to me? How is it helping me fulfill that? If you ask those two questions, you've got a different life. The quality of your life is based on quality of the question, Jess. There's seven questions you want to ask yourself. What is that I would absolutely love to do in life? How do I handsomely get paid to do it? What are the highest priority actions I can do today to make it happen? What obstacles might I run into and how do I solve them in advance by pre-planning? What worked and what didn't work today? 
How do I do it more effectively and efficiently tomorrow? And how did no matter what happened today, how's it still helping me get my dream? What does the word failure have to do with anything? Failure is an illusion. When you're, they know when people live by their highest values, they see feedback. Yes. The only people that see failure is somebody who's holding on to a fantasy about how things are supposed to be, and it's not matching their fantasy and their labeling or failure. The addiction to success is what gives people the perceptions of failure. I don't pursue success. I pursue a mission. I'm a man on a mission, not a person that people want to label. They always want to label you successful or failure or whatever based on their values and projections on you. Success is a depurposing process and failure is a repurposing process. When you think you're successful, you're proud and you're narcissistic. You think, oh, I've arrived and everything else. You start doing low priority stuff. When you think you're a failure, you go back to high priority stuff. When you're focused on a mission, you stay on mission and you don't get sidetracked by those false labels that we put on people. So people who are living and doing something they're inspired by are just doing what they love to do and they don't put a label on it, success or failure. They don't put those labels on it. It's all feedback. It's all trying to get us to live most authentically in our life. Everything that's going on in our life, our physiology, our psychology, our sociology, and even our theological constructs are feedback mechanisms to get us authentic. And when we're authentic, we're graced. We're in a state of inspiration. We're thankful. We feel we're doing what we love. And we're actually making a difference in people's lives. I'm seeing a, po- a lot of the challenges coming about at this time are because we were taught to follow others, to go by the rote, rather than to have our own opinion and things. That is getting shaken loose right now, isn't it? Yes. Conformity uh, is stagnation. If you, if you go by what the majority of people are, stop thinking about this. The Nobel Prize winners are not the people that follow everybody else. Yeah. The Olympic medalists are not the people that follow everybody else. The great business leaders, spiritual leaders, financial leaders, anybody who's any done anything are the people that were the unborrowed visionaries that trailblazed a new pathway and went out and did something that was original to them. And they went against the grain temporarily. First, they got ridiculed. They got violently opposed until they became self-evident with a new way of doing things. And usually it could last 30 to 60 years of, of ridicule for doing it. But those are the ones that made a difference. So if you're going to fit in and you're going to conform you're going to have, a, a, in a sense, as Ernest Becker does a de- in his Denial of Death, in his book, Denial of Death, which is a Pulitzer Prize winner. If you want to go do that way and be involved in the collective heroism and be a spectator and go to the football games and go to the big churches and go to the big places where you're looking for heroes that lived in the past or some fantasies of the future, instead of actually getting down and go do something amazing with your life, you're going to not play the bigger game. You're going to play small in your life. It's about tackling challenges and going after something that's amazing in your life if you want to really go and do something. At the end of your life, you're going to ask a simple question. Did I do everything I could with everything I was given? And if you can say, I friggin' did it, then great. You had an amazing life. If not, you'd had a life of mediocrity. And you're going to end up with Bonnie Ware's five major regrets in life. So I want to talk for a minute about genius divergent thinking or divergence level thinking, because one of the challenges that I see, maybe it's not a real challenge, maybe it's a good challenge, is that we have been so trained to go with, not go with the flow, to go with what others tell us, the largest hammer or nail gets hammered down, that we may struggle at this point to actually be able to see out of the box. There's, you know, paperclip studies, five-year-old kids are shown as genius, genius level divergence thinking, because they can think of 200 plus uses to do with a paperclip. They give it to an adult. The adult comes up with 10 or 15. What's a way we can start to train our mind to think of more possibilities because we may not even be able to see them? It's been shown very clearly that genius, innovation, creativity, original thinking that serves humanity originates from challenge. Doesn't come from, it doesn't come from support. You take a child and support them and make it easy on them and take them and make it so easy where they have no responsibilities, they're not going to think creatively. It's when they've been challenged and they've got to come up with things and they're held accountable when they come up with creativity. So if you're not filling your day with challenges that inspire you, which awakens your creativity, you're going to end up living in the comfort zone and you're going to end up just going through stagnation and you're going to go with a, what they call brain offloading. When you're basically not inspired by what your life is, you don't want to make decisions, it's low on your values, you brain offload and think, well, they know, probably know better than me, I'll just follow what the herd is. You'll use your mirror neurons and your chameleon effect to just follow what everybody else does because it must be right if they're doing it. But if it was right and 99% of the population is not financially independent, if you follow the 99%, you ain't going to be financially independent. 99% of the people are not the leaders in anything in the sense of businesses or finances or intellects or spirituality, whatever. 
it's the small percentage. It's the polymathic individuals that went outside the box that did the things that made the difference. So you got to go and ask yourself who you're really following. If you actually, are you really following just because the masses say so? That which circulates the most usually has the least value. That's basic proof. If we start challenging ourselves in any one area, is that a good way to get the motor, to get the Evan Rude going again so that we can start to take on challenges in other areas? Do it in the area that is highest on your value first and you'll build the most momentum for all the areas. Then ask yourself how to empower all. I've been working on helping people empower all areas of their life. There's no reason why you can't. There's absolutely no reason why you can't com- make a difference in every one of the areas. Have an international business, become financially independent, have a fantastic global relationship, have social influence. None of those are outside the ballpark. I was a street kid as a kid. I've got an amazing life today because I followed the principles that stood the test of time. And it's not something, it's not rocket science. It's simply prioritization in your life. If you stick to priority and not sit there and subordinate to outside people that are bitching and go out there and do something that enriching, amazing life starts happening. It's not something overnight. If you're wanting immediate gratification, don't ever expect an amazing life. It's long-term vision with high-priority actions that really serve a difference and make a difference, solving problems in people's lives and in the world that make you have a great life in life. Woohoo! Do you have a methodology, um, like I teach automatic writing, a way to get out of yourself and, and let the pen roll so that you can start to get a big picture on who and what you are? Do you have a technique that you teach people so that they can get out of, well, actually so that they can start to create this dialogue with themselves? Well, the first thing to do is go through and do the value determination to get clear about what's really their life demonstrating is valuable. Because I, I ask people, how many of you want to be financially independent? Everybody puts a hand up, but nobody's doing it. Yes. They're buying consumables that depreciate in value and they keep fantasizing about their lifestyles of the rich and famous instead of actually taking their money that they earn and buying assets so it works for them. So they don't really have a value on that. They just think they do. So first get clear about what's really, 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 truly valuable to them then prioritize their life, then basically sit down and get specialized knowledge in that area that allows them to accelerate and build momentum in the area that they do. Then learn the art of taking no matter what happens to them and flipping it like our intuition does and finding the downs to the upsides and the ups to the downsides to find the means so I can center, you can center yourself and not let emotions and distortions run your life all the time. Can you explain that? I, I want to pause you on that one. The downs to the upside and the ups to the downside. Can you, can you go into a little greater detail there? Yeah, when you're infatuated with somebody, you're blind to the downsides. When you're resentful to somebody, you're blind to the upsides. When you see both sides, you get to love somebody because they're going to have both sides. So if you don't know how to ask the questions when you're infatuated, what are the downsides? You're going to be sucked into a fantasy and we have a fatal attraction and find out the hard way and then have the wisdom of the ages with the aging process instead of the wisdom of the ages without the aging process. The same thing on resentment. So when you're resenting something, what's the upsides to it? So it's no longer something you resent and you're infatuated. What's the downsides? To balance it out to see both sides of life. When you see both sides of life, the world on the outside doesn't run you. If you're highly infatuated or resentful, you can barely sleep at night because you got all the noise in your brain. When you're centered and you're balanced, you sleep well. You wake up inspired and you take actions because you have real objectives, not fantasies. Thank you. So was there a next piece after the down to the upside, the up to the downside and getting centered? Well, if you do, then take a, make, make a list of what you did accomplish today and keep records of what you're accomplishing. I've got the largest collection of gratitudes of anybody I've ever met on the planet, and I can do it every single day. You'll be on that list today from doing the, getting the opportunity to do the, the, the interview. So, so I put that on the list every day because if you're grateful for what you got, you train yourself to look at what you've gotten to do today and thankful for that. It helps your brain look in terms of that throughout whatever happens in your life, no matter what happens in life. How is it helping me fulfill what's my mission in life so I can be grateful for it? When you see it on the way, not in the way, you don't build up a a subconsciously stored baggage. You build up fuel of opportunity. You turn fermions into bosons. (laughs) Woohoo! So fermions into bosons. Tell us about your opinion on the news. (laughs) I rarely pay attention to the news. The only time I even pay attention to TV is when I'm on it. Uh, and I'm trying to do my best to try to share something that's hopefully rational. I learned from Gandhi when I was 18 years old to, to put my energy onto something that's more important. I'd rather read Mortimer Adler's Syntopic in Volumes 1 and 2, which is the greatest ideas from the greatest minds of the last 2,700 years, and partake in thinking with thinkers that are really making a difference in the world and their massive contributions than I would to watch the temporary news, which is sensational, which is usually biased, which is usually distracting, 
It doesn't keep me up to date with what's really going on. It's just what sensates. Is there something that keeps you up to date? Because what I look at is the energy of that. And I look at it, I used to call it negative worthless stimulation. It might have been important to know what's locked down, what's not. But now it's just dragging people into the gutter. Well, if you're sitting there worrying about that, their job in, in television is to keep you sensated. They're going to do something that grabs your attention. Okay, so if you don't have anything more important to do than to be doing that, they're running your life. Why would I want somebody else running my life? I want me to run my life. If I fill my day with what inspires me that makes a difference in other people's lives, I'm going to go farther in life than if I sit there and get distracted by bull that's on television half the time. And by the way, it's controversial all the time. You'll see one sta station says this, a sta another station will say the opposite. We have CNN. They basically condemn Trump and Fox praises him. They both have both sides. If I paid attention to one and only that, I wouldn't see both sides. So if I see both sides, I'm fine. If I only see one side, I know it's a subjective bias. If I do that, I'm getting false information. Why would I want to fill my mind with false information that's sensating me and getting me emotional and distracted when I can go and focus on something that's priority that gets me a result that makes a difference that allows fair exchange and allows me to move forward in my life? To me, that's way more, more priority to me. I'd rather read a great piece of work. I was reading see a, this gentleman's work on uh, Gilbert Lewis, Gilbert N. Lewis, who is a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, right? I was looking at the, this great piece. This is a masterpiece. He got a Nobel Prize for it because it was talking about the relationship of polarities uh, in chemistry. It has more influence on human psychology than half the stuff I see on TV. Understanding how people work. I'd rather read somebody who's thought that's really done a contribution on the planet and fill my day and stand on the shoulders of giant individuals that make a difference than to sit there and go by the willowing and wallowing emotional crazies that go on television all the time. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, what's the importance of, of managing our emotions? And maybe we could even talk in terms of money or the stock market. The stock market, it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. When it, when it has what is called an average, a mean. Yeah. Okay, roughly a mean. It's never an exact mean, but it's close. You can get within, within a 25-year period, you can get pretty close to the mean within a very small percentage. When it goes above the mean, if you're buying stock, you're paying much more than what it's worth. Uh, but it's gain process from what you purchased before. So the the upside is what you bought before. It looks like it's going up, but you're overpaying for the price. So that's the downside, and that's the upside. Then when the stock market goes down, you can buy cheap stock. That's the good side. But it's going down temporarily, so what you previously bought doesn't look like it's making progress. So there's always a pro and a con to it. So it doesn't matter what the stock market does. If you keep buying, it doesn't matter. You, it just averages out. If your expectation is what the mean is, then you have a realistic expectation. It's objective and you get the mean. Otherwise, you let the emotions run you. I keep putting money in the stock market. I've made a fortune, particularly during the coronavirus. I, I'm very grateful for it. Thank you, coronavirus. It made me a lot of money. So in the process of doing that, I just look at the long term mean. I don't let the ups and downs and the emotions of other people or society or TV or whatever interfere with my mission. Because if you are run by the outside world instead of the voice and the vision on the inside, you're not going to go as far in life. I said on the movie The Secret, and now the new movie has come out, How to Talk to Become Things, which is a sequel to The Secret, finally, which is a fantastic movie. It's going gangbusters right now. What happens, I said that when the voice and the vision on the inside is louder than all opinions on the outside, you begin to master your life. It's true. But most people let the outside world run their life and distract them from what's the inner vision. When you don't know what your inner vision is, you're vulnerable to the outer world. But if you're in the vision, I'd rather you got two ways. You can either follow the crowd or you can build a crowd. Which one do you want? You can be a leader of a crowd and have a massive following and impacting people. And you can be the one that's living by design or you can live by default following the crowd. And I guarantee you, nobody's getting up in the morning and dedicating their life to your fulfillment. If you're not doing it, nobody's doing it. It sounds like we get up in the morning, put the feet on the ground and say, all right, I'm dedicating my life to my fulfillment. What's the highest priority thing I can do for my mission, for my objective today, bar none? Yes, that will make a difference because it has to be in fair exchange with serving of other people. Finding out what serves the needs of others that inspires you the most is your niche. That's your niche in life. I found my niche when I was 17, 18 years old. I've been focused on the niche ever since. I'm very grateful for finding it. But many people are, are slow in getting it. But I guarantee there's nobody that doesn't have a niche. It's just finding it. And most people are kind of looking for somebody else and following somebody else and trying to envy somebody else and imitate somebody else instead of actually being themselves. Why be second at somebody else when you can be first at being you? Woohoo! 
Is there any one thing that you would tell people is if you've got to, if you take this one step before anything else, this will help you to reframe, to um, come alive again during this time? Well, I think I've already said it, but that is to ask what's the highest priority action step you can do today, right now, this minute, and how is whatever's happening to me right now, this minute, how is it helping me do it? Quit comparing your current reality to fantasies of the past or the future and get present with what's happening now and how is how specifically is what I'm doing right now helping me get what I want and what is the highest priority action I can do to help me fulfill that. If you do that on a daily basis, you're taking command of your perceptions, you're taking complaint of your actions. You only have three things you can control, perception, decisions, and actions. And doing both of those allows you the maximum potential in, in, as a human being in life. If you do that every day, you're going to have a different momentum building activity and a result. Thank you. I've had a lot of people on on our uh, YouTube lives, other events lately talking about, I need to move. I need to downsize. I've lost my home. I've lost my this. I've lost my that. You're saying there's an, always an upside. How do we get out of the downside and start to see the upside? If you're sitting there thinking only the downside, that's the illusion in the first place. Because maybe if you had a house that you're having to download, maybe you were living beyond your means and you're basically paying for something you were over your head in and you're basically paying a bank instead of actually putting money into your money to make it work for you. And you're thinking a mortgage is an investment. And maybe it's time to wake up and realize that that's, that's, that's a survival mode. The majority of people are sitting there getting in bank debts. They're getting in mortgages. They're getting in credit card. They don't know what money is. They don't know what assets are. And this may wake them up and finally get a realization about how money works instead of sitting there living beyond their means and struggling and putting themselves in debt all the time. So this might prioritize things, get them down to what's really important and start to do it. I had a guy that basically lived a very simple life, right? He, 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 when he was in professional school and he graduated from professional school, he started to practice. The first 10 years, he floundered. Then somebody came along and helped him mentor something and he started to save a portion of it. And the more he saved, it seemed like more business was coming to him. The more he saved, when you start managing money wisely, you start attracting more money to manage. But instead of raising his lifestyle, he just kept raising his savings and investments. And he kept doing that, kept doing that, kept doing that, kept doing that until he found at the right time to buy the property. And he bought a place right next door to a guy named Bill Gates. And Bill Gates wasn't known at the time, but Bill Gates started growing the land and upgrading the value of the land there in, in Washington. And all of a sudden, this guy went from a person that was in mediocrity to somebody that went very fortunate because he, instead of living beyond his means, he was thinking long term, not immediate gratification. Immediate gratification is going to cost you your life. Long term vision is going to pay in business, in finance, in relationship, in health. Every area of your life, the longer the vision, the greater the return. The short term immediate gratification in, in, is a debauchery of life instead of a philanthropy of life. Thank you. So I want to take the last few minutes and I want to, I want to talk about these things, mortgage assets, and, and you're the 10% account master. So maybe we start there with the 10% account. What did you do? How important is it even or especially during this time? Well, I didn't stop any savings. I kept it and I've increased it since this time. But what I do is I learned that if I, if I manage money wise, I get more money to manage. So I stick a portion into savings. I then get a cushion account I then start to invest it into assets. I buy quality assets. I what buy are companies. assets? An asset is something that puts money in your pocket instead of taking it out. Buying a house with a mortgage is not an asset unless you downside someday later. Most of it, you have taxes on it. You've got uh, repairs on it, maintenance, depreciation. You've got landscaping. You've got all you're doing. That's all lifestyle. An asset is buying a property and having a rental property, and it gives you an income that exceeds the actual cost. Uh, an asset is buying stocks. It gives you capital gains and dividends that exceed the cost and give you a return. An asset is something that goes up in value over time, and a liability is something that goes down in value over time. And most people buy things that aren't assets, and they wonder why they're stressed financially because they don't know the difference. And they, when they do and they start doing it, they, when they start to manage it wisely, they start getting more income coming in. Their business starts growing. Because money circulates through the economy from those who value it least to those who value it most. And those who value it and don't know how to understand it and manage it to those who know how to manage it. And so when you start to do that, you receive opportunities. And the second you start to put it, people that really value themselves and value what they're doing and value contribution and value wealth are the people that put money into assets. And the people that don't value themselves, don't value serving people, don't value uh, economic returns, 
are the people that keep buying liabilities. I've seen it over and over again over the years I've been doing this. In 38 years, I've been teaching things on finances. And, I, and some people, because of their values, they do not have the value for financial wealth building. Wealth building. And wealth means wheel, which means health. So if it, the lower the socioeconomic, the lower the health care. The higher the socioeconomic, the higher the health response. So if you're not building wealth also, you're going to also affect your health. And you're going to shorten, shorten your lifespan. You're going, to reduce, you're going to reduce your stresses by building wealth and have it work for you. You're going to add to your stresses. The purpose of financial independence is not for the great so-called lifestyle. The purpose of financial independence is to do something you love to do because you don't have to do it. You do it because you love to. Woohoo! So go real ba- briefly back to a 10% account. It, as people, they start listening to everything here today, there will come a day where actually you are able to pay your bills and there is an extra penny, 10 cents, dollar, maybe even before that, when do we start putting something away for ourselves and what do we do with that money? Immediately. You don't wait. Immediately. If you wait for doing it, it's never going to happen because you never developed the habit of saving. It's not how much you save, it's the habit of saving that matters. I started out at a dollar an hour, $10 a day, $50 a week, $200 a month, and I was a doctor. I made it 300 a quarter, three months later. I made it 500 three months later. I made it 750 three months later. I made it 1,000 three months later. I kept raising it every quarter. If you're not putting challenges that inspire you, that make you grow towards something you want in life, you keep getting challenges that don't. So I just kept increasing it, and I never stopped increasing it. And it went up to 2,000 and 4,000 and 8 and 16 and 32 and 64 and 128 and $256,000 in a month by doing that. I drew opportunity into my life because I managed money wisely. And the moment you do, your life changes. And 10%, if you're 20 years old, if you're saving 10%, you're okay. But if you're 30 years old, you need to save 20%. If you're 40 years old, you need to be saving 30%. Every decade you go in delay, you're losing compound interest and compounding and opportunity. You need to increase that percentage. And if you're not doing it, you go, I can't do it, then you have no intention of having money work for you. You have, a, you have an intention to work your life for money. When it's into, into investments, the only time it goes anywhere is to further investments. You can't take it out and spend it or you're not really saving and investing. You're just putting it away and then you're buying stuff. That means you have a higher value on buying stuff than you do on having it work for you. I don't, I don't spend it. I have it work for me. And then the interest off it can pay me for the lifestyle. But I want to make sure I never exceed the principle and make sure it grows faster than I'm using any interest on it. Woohoo! Where can people go to find out more, John, and to find everything you're doing in all your programs right now? The simple place to do it is simply go to my website, drdmartini.com. Thank you. And any last words? This, this has been... This is certainly been, I'm so glad that you got some sleep last night because last week, from what I understand, you were on the hero's journey. So first, let me say that. Well, I, I, was, I was doing a program in Australia. I'm here in Houston. And so I started the program at 5 p.m. and I went to 7 a.m. because that's their daytime. It's a 14-hour program. So we did that for five days. And then I finished that. Now I got another one in India tonight from, from 10 to 3 a.m. So then so I, I had to rearrange my schedule a little bit to do it. But you know what? Getting to do what I love doing is timeless. That's, that's what matters. Doing something you really love to do is what's, what's, what's a few minutes here if you reschedule and structure it efficiently. Yeah. But I believe that you, you, you're not going through life to just exist. You're doing something to do something that's inspiring to you and make a difference in the world. So you got to give yourself permission to do something extraordinary in life. Otherwise, your life's going to be ordinary. And I don't know about you, but I don't have a desire to get up and have an ordinary life. That's not, that's not in my vocabulary. No way. And, and I think this is the shakeup. So, so you're the first person to call it St. Corona. This is the shakeup that St. Corona is giving us that is allowing us, forcing us, requiring us, putting the mirror in our face that's saying, are you going to start living now? Because there's another way out there. You can start to find it today. Replay this interview over and over and over again. Go to Dr. Demartini's website. But this is, heck, join one of our boot camps. This is the opportunity right here, right now, being presented to you to live a different way. That's it. That's a simple truth. It's not what happens to us. It's what we decide to do with it. It's time to decide to do something different with it. Not wallowing and being a pity. Don't be a victim of your history. Be a master of your destiny. Woohoo! So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, be inspired, and begin creating your new and improved and inspired life today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so, so much, John. Thank you. Thank you. 
If you're watching this, then you are a light worker. You're a light warrior, and I want to help. We offer everything from boot camps, mini masterclasses, full on masterminds, and private one on one coaching with me. To find out more about our upcoming courses, simply visit inspirenationuniversity.com or click on the links below. And to find out more about coaching, simply visit inspirenationuniversity.com backslash coaching. We also have weekly YouTube live events with me where you can ask me your questions live and YouTube premieres featuring me and our guest. Simply subscribe below and click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows. I just had one of my most inspiring, chock full, amazing, energy filled, direction filled, mission impossible, mission possible interviews with Dr. John Demartini. To check out more inspiring interviews, click here, subscribe below, click on that bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows. Be sure to join us for our boot camps. You can find out more about them down below. Give us a thumbs up if you liked it. Leave your comments. Love you guys so, so much. Now is your time to shine. Shine bright. Woohoo! Love you guys so much.